Shut up and sit down. Good evening, everyone. It's your man of the hour, the Tower of Power, the living legend of professional wrestling punditry. Hello, my name is Lee Hazel, and this is the Steel Chair Shot, where we stare into the abyss between what fans want from a wrestling product and everything WWE actually puts out this week. This week, it's SmackDown's second brand split pay-per-view, No Mercy. We've really been getting a feel for how the PPV structure is working for them. Personally, there have only been three of them so far, and I'm already feeling fatigued. Kurt Hawkins kicks off the night by strutting down to the ring with what I can only assume was the first draft of Eva Marie's gimmick. The announcer reels off those Kurt Hawkins slash Chuck Norris jokes like he's a 1960s Rat Pack comedian. Not even Hawkins looks like he believes what the announcer is saying about him. I must have missed the part in WWE history where Kurt Hawkins was relevant. I don't remember a single thing about his original WWE run. He makes a surprise reappearance on TV making jokes that replace Chuck Norris's name with his own, a line of humour that's about as relevant as the Microsoft Zoom, and I'm supposed to care that he's making a comeback? Well I don't, and I honestly don't know what on earth he did to get signed in the first place. Maybe when he actually starts wrestling on this week's Smackdown, I'll finally start getting it. American Alpha and the Hype Brothers team up against the Vaude Villains and the Ascension next. It seems that in order for the girls to have one more match on the roster, something has to be sacrificed and the dear little lambs in this case have been the tag team division. The heel turn of the Usos and the glory of Heath, his kids and his pet Rhino have converged into one storyline, leaving all the other tag teams with nothing to do. Once again, the most exciting tag team on the roster, American Alpha, have been left off the main card. This continues to be the most baffling part of the SmackDown brand. Perhaps you think that a little bit fanboyish of me, but they are by far and away the best tag team on the roster, and the whole division is weaker when they aren't in the title picture. They don't even have a strong storyline at the moment, and their directionlessness is emblematic of the entire tag team division at the moment. Regardless, American Alpha do get the win with grand amplitude. In what has to be said is a dictionary definition of a dark match. No story, no stakes, just WWE saying, here are the people you like, beating the people you don't like. It's a wasted opportunity to get something rolling with the tag teams on the lower card, especially the uh, Ascension and the Vaude Villains, who are much needed heel teams in a waning division, and both of whom are in desperate need of reinvigoration in the fans' eyes. The first match going into the pay-per-view proper is a match that would usually be in the main event. The only time I've ever seen the title fought for in an opener is in a joint brand production, where the more important belt is given the traditional main event status in the final match, while the secondary belt is given the opening. Anyway, this was all done uh, in order to avoid the main event clashing with the presidential debate. The pacing issue in this is clear. Three of the biggest stars in the industry starting out your show is going to be a hard act to follow, especially for a match of this caliber. This is real main event stuff. The only thing holding it back is the almost certain feeling that the title was never going to change hands. Cena matching Ric Flair's record is something you're only ever going to see on one of the big four shows, and him beating it will only be ever seen at WrestleMania. Each man in the match had well-defined roles that perfectly suited their offense. Ambrose is a street fighter, Styles is a high-flying technician, and Cena is an unstoppable powerhouse. This was three men working the things that they know best and that they are the best in the world at. Crucially for me, this one didn't use Ambrose as a sacrifice to protect the legacy of Cena when he predictably doesn't win. AJ looked heelish as he kept the belt through the use of a chair shot and despite tapping earlier in the match, although I do worry that they are making the same mistake with him as they did with Rollins last year. Heel or not, the champ must have a sense of legitimacy to him, otherwise it devalues the belt. I mean, AJ Styles does have a huge sense of legitimacy to us because we've seen what he can do in ROH and TNA and New Japan, but in the eyes of the casuals, he might die a death as just another star that was pushed too far and on too little. Hopefully his stellar work in the ring will help him succeed where the likes of Jack Swagger and Sheamus failed. Regardless, it looks like John Cena won't be getting lucky after the show's ended tonight. The match set to follow this one, the one that's been sent out to die like a 20th century teenage boy in a European war, was won by his girlfriend, and because of his stellar performance work in the previous match, no one will remember her doing so. It was a forgettable match that only served to prolong a feud that already seems to have been going on forever. Carmella needed more time to cook in NXT because she's still a little pink in the middle here. I get the feeling that even though this rivalry might have been desired to increase her stock, WWE might just use it to bring Nikki back to prominence instead and sweep Carmella under a rug a little until she browns off. I get the feeling they've done it backwards with these two. Nikki before her injury was one of the best heels on the card, and Carmella in NXT was a very likeable presence, although that did taper off a little bit when she separated from Enzo and Kaz. She is showing a talent for viciousness, but I think that trait would be uh, better served in a badass face persona. Nikki wins, which I can only assume will mean a rubber match somewhere down the line, and it's there that we'll see if WWE still thinks that Carmella is under keep. Heath Slater and Rhino defend the tag titles against the Usos next, and every time I read about Heath Slater, I feel like the Grinch's evil stepmother. I just don't get it. 
Funniest bits about him and his kids is when the crowd all holds up signs saying that they all want his child support. But that's what the fans have added to the story, not something that Heath himself has done. And it mirrors uh, my feelings uh, about Damien Sandow during his time as the Miz's stunt double. I didn't find that funny either. It was only really made funny by the fans, by people outside of the ring, not inside of it. And when it's up to the audience to make the fun for themselves, someone has failed. Scripted comedy rarely works in wrestling. You know, it's got to at least seem off the cuff in order for it to be any good. Another thing it needs to be is brief. Heath and Rhino winning means we'll probably have to put up with their antics for another six weeks at least. It's another case of WWE milking a joke long past the point where the cow was keeled over and died. They can't just let something reach a natural and logical conclusion here if there are t-shirts to be sold and ten-year-old Asian children to chain to sewing machines still. I'll confess, I like my tag teams to be tag teams. That's what the tag team division is for. Sticking two singles wrestlers together is cheating especially when they're just held together with blue tack and duct tape like Rhino and Heath Slater are. Blue Peter badge winners have cobbled together sturdier stuff than these two. It's a real bugbear of mine. I like tag teams to have a strong sense of identity as a team, or else what's the point? Uh, to use the division to set up a feud between these two partners? Fine, just don't give them the belts and don't put them in the title picture. Proper tag teams have earned these titles. Okay, it's nice to see Heath get some recognition, but isn't his appointment with Victory here from relative obscurity just further proof on SmackDown that tag teams are at the bottom of the food chain at the moment? The match itself was fine, the Usos looked credible heels and they kept up their convincing gangster act well, although with their new wardrobe they look more like models from The Gap. And there's nothing wrong with Heath and Rhino in the ring, they just don't capture my imagination like they seem to have done with everybody else. And now here's a match that should definitely have been on the kickoff show. Jack Swagger vs Baron Corbin. They clearly don't have enough belief in their own wrestling ability to keep the interest of the fans if they stay inside the ring for too long, so they almost immediately go to the outside using what I've come to call Bums Rush Wrestling, where both guys just try to take each other by the collar and the seat of their pants and chuck each other into barriers and announce tables and such. Bret Hart calls it easy wrestling. But there is a bit where Corbin gets Swagger's hand caught in between the stairs and the ring post and from there Swagger sells the injury pretty well and Corbin does look vicious going after. It. Corbin wins and gets another chance of proving himself to management and the crowd. Next is a match that Dolph Ziggler quite rightly said should have been the main event on the card. By putting his career on the line for the Intercontinental title, Dolph has reinvigorated this rivalry for the second time in two months. We should all be sick of this, it should bore us to death, but Miz vs Ziggler doesn't. These two have come such a long way, but what surprises me most though is that Dolph wasn't this good when he was fighting for the world title at SummerSlam. And my only answer to that is that he must just get on better with the Miz as an opponent. You know, if you watch them um, uh, on the WWE Network, they've got the Ride Along series, and in one episode of that, uh, it showed these two, and they seem to be pretty decent friends, you know, they're both Cleveland boys, and they have a rapport that has allowed them to produce not only these great matches, but this epic storyline to connect them. Dolph is really reaching in from deep within to win the title from the Miz, and Miz is pulling out all of the stops. All of the stops. The eye spray from Maurice, uh, the turnbuckle, uh, the spirit squad even came out. Although the outcome is somewhat telegraphed by certain little touches throughout the match. Firstly, Dolph is repping the cancer charities hard with his pink ring attire. By the way, him and pink, best since the Hart family. He's earned the right to wear that colour. But you know WWE aren't booking a cancer charity to lose. You know, they might have done so in the Attitude Era, but not now. Secondly, whatever Dolph has done to earn his current position as lovable loser, even he cannot lose his career at the hands of the Spirit Squad. Give the man some dignity at least. Miz really is one of the best heels in the industry. He knows what his strengths are. He's an actor, so he acts. Before the match, he raises the belt higher than the Hollywood sign. He holds it above his head for so long, I start to think he's been doing too many pull-ups and he can't bring his arms down. The ending of that match, he is the polar opposite. I've never seen such a genuine expression of misery in a WWE ring. A face like a smacked ass is right if he just spent a full working day in Helga's house of pain. He looks like a man who, after a lifetime of believing a romanticized portrait is his reflection, he finally sees his real visage in the mirror for the first time. Fantastic match, and typically for WWE programming, it's all downhill from here. The next match is Alexa Bliss and she's supposed to be facing Becky Lynch for the Smackdown Women's title but Alexa Bliss clearly has not been saying her prayers. Not only is she denied her title shot because Becky Lynch is ill, she's booked to lose her match against Lynch's replacement. Booking her to lose just doesn't make her look weak, it makes the whole division look weak. 
She's beat a bunch of wrestlers for the chance to fight for the title, and now she looks like a fraud. I would say she deserves better than to be thrust into the spotlight only to be jobbed out, but her walk towards the end of the match might just prove WWE's point. Then again, Naomi wasn't blameless either, she had her own fair share of botches. The actual main event of the night is Autumn vs Wyatt. There are a number of reasons why this made the main event over the Miz and Ziggler intercontinental title fight. Firstly, there were segments throughout the show teasing the fight and Wyatt's abilities as a supernatural force. Secondly, Orton is a bigger star than Ziggler and Miz. Thirdly, it had the flashiest finish. Let me denounce those one by one. Firstly, the segments that led up to the main event were bullshit. They reminded me of the stuff that The Undertaker would pull in his feud with Orton back in 2005, only instead of Bob Orton's face dripping with blood, we have this gutless PG version that looked like uh, the kind of special effects that they use in an old Goosebumps TV show. Secondly, Orton needs to put in a few more decent performances if he wants to be higher on the card than Miz and Ziggler right now. At least, he would have to in the world I want to live in. Thirdly, that finish was as anticlimactic as an OAP's orgasm. I know we're not supposed to pine for the days when wrestling had soap opera finishes that made EastEnders look like Downton Abbey, but come on. This was the watered down Diet Coke version of a finish from the Attitude Era that only served to remind us how much fun those finishes could be if they were done properly. The match itself was sluggish and suffered immeasurably for coming last on a card that had two excellent matches that couldn't live up to either. I didn't even care that Bray Wyatt got a win, a desperately needed win, and I'm a Bray Wyatt mark. I guess it's because he wins matches all the time, just people don't notice. What he never wins is the feud, and I can't see that happening here either. At Survivor Series, they'll default to Alden Alton as the biggest star, and that's if their feud even makes it to that point. And after that, I'm kind of glad we don't have another SmackDown event for another six weeks. You know, I'll be happier after Hell in a Cell where there will be no WWE programming for me to cover until Survivor Series. You know, I sound really down on wrestling at the moment, but I'm not. We had two Match of the Year contenders tonight, and then that makes shows like this, you know, really worth watching. But we also had a bunch of matches that really make the struggle to justify two pay-per-views a month even more difficult. It's overwhelming, and for Europeans it's exhausting, because we have to give up a night's sleep every two weeks just to cover these events, and put up our thoughts on them while they remain relevant, he says while publishing a review on the Thursday after the event has taken place. I like the more laid-back WWE and its focus on wrestling and not sensationalism, but there's so much crap around the diamonds. No, not crap, that's unfair. Some of it is, sure, but the more apt comparison would be sand. There's just loads of it. And it's just there. And we have to dig through a hell of a lot of it just to get to the stuff that we really want. Well, there you go, folks. That was a steel chair shot. Thank you for listening to all of my ramblings. And please don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment if you agree or if you disagree. Check out the mag below, and we'll catch you all on social media.